This is not an easy Parsha to read in 2023. I think Hunter's Devar started to show us that the Torah does not change, but we can. Mm. And so in weeks where we feel the gulf between the words in that sacred text and the values that we hold dear, it's really natural to feel uncomfortable, to feel angry, to feel rejected, resentful, perplexed. So I want to give a warning that I am going to dive into issues of disability justice and access, both in our Parsha and in the modern world. And if that is going to be hard for you to hear, you have the autonomy to leave the room at any time. I also want to acknowledge that one of the things that I am most known for at Mishkan, and generally, is my love, you might call it an obsession, with Peloton and with exercise. I am a person who lives with invisible disabilities, but I do not know what it is like to live in the world in a body that does not allow me to fully inhabit the spaces that I want to be in. So I want to especially today uplift the voices of disability advocates and people who are living in the world in a way that affects them in a way that I cannot know. I hope, if anything, that you walk out of here today with a fire to learn more and especially to learn it from people who are living that experience. So to come right out and say it, the problem with Parshat Emor is that it articulates different standards for people living in normative bodies and people living in bodies with disabilities or bodies with different appearances and abilities. For those who haven't heard the term, we might refer to Parshat Emor as ableist. Ableism is the complex set of social structures and cultural attitudes that privilege certain bodies or minds as normal and others as abnormal. And in this week's Parsha, ableism manifests as a prohibition on priests with physical differences participating in and leading sacrificial worship in the temple. The Torah says, God says, speak to Aaron and tell him, Ish mizara chaladorotam asher mum lo ikarev lehakriv lechem elohav. Anyone of your line for all time who has a mum, for now we're going to tentatively translate that as defect, but we're going to come back to that, may not ever offer the, sacri- the sacred offering of his God. And then the Torah lays out, as Grandpa David read, some specific physical differences that might prohibit a priest from participating, such as limb differences, blindness, a limp, even people with large moles or scars or scoliosis or dwarfism or a broken limb. And like much of the book of Exodus, God doesn't give an explicit reason for these laws, which leaves us to fill in the blank on why, which we might fill in from our own prejudices, from our own ideas. So one option that we might say When we look at this Parsha, why is it like this? We might say, the Torah is discriminatory. We might think of the God of the Torah as being discriminatory of people with certain bodies, or perhaps the authors of the Torah were. Maybe we look at the Parsha and we ask why, and we say, it's because of a perceived ability of certain people to perform the roles of sacrificial work in the temple. Someone with a limb difference or a physical disability might not have been able to perform the work that God had prescribed, and therefore, they couldn't do it. And then we might hear that reason, and we might say, oh, right, that makes sense. You can't do the work, you can't do the work. That's not about discrimination or ableism, it's just the way things are. But even that explanation should give us pause. Because in other points in the Torah, the Torah is specifically written to be inclusive. When it comes to building the Mishkan, people are allowed to bring whatever they are able, whatever their heart moves them. We go out of our way to leave the corners of our fields unharvested so that people who need extra food can take it. We are commanded to take care of the sick and the poor and the needy, to not take someone's cloak if they're going to have nothing to sleep under at night. Heck, the Torah even tells us to love our neighbor as ourself and to see each and every person as made in God's image. So why not bring that ethos to temple service? You might even find yourself asking when you look at this Parsha, if I believe in a God who is powerful and that God doesn't seem to want disabilities in God's service, why not just eliminate them altogether? And that is actually the vision of the prophet Isaiah, who imagines a possible redemptive future 
where no one has a disability. So chapter 35 of Isaiah reads, Strengthen the hands that are slack, make firm the tottering knees. Say to the anxious of heart, be strong, fear not. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, and the limping shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless shall shout aloud. And a highway shall appear there, which shall be called the sacred way. This, it might seem, is a redemptive fix to the problem in Parshat Amor. No more exclusion if there's no more different abilities. But as Rabbi Julia Watts Belzer, who is a disability advocate and a professor at Georgetown University writes, the vision in Isaiah is not actually an inclusive future. We don't want a future, she says, where no one has a disability. That is an erasure of important identities and an erasure of important ways of knowing the world. Instead, she reimagines Isaiah's messianic vision as one where that road becomes a ramp that is accessible to her in her wheelchair, that has guide rails along it for people who need help navigating, that has signposts for people who cannot hear, and so much more. The messianic future that she imagines is not one without disability. It's one where inclusion is innate. That is what I wish I saw in the Torah. Not the exclusion of entire categories of people based on their physical characteristics. Not even a way to accommodate them within the existing system. But rather a system that was built to honor each and every person. That honors their own lived experience and allows them to be fully present in the world. The passage of the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, requires employers and state and local governments and businesses to provide equal access and opportunities for people with disabilities. Since the passage of this monumental law, buildings have built ramps and elevators and employers have granted mental health leave and public transportation has changed to include wheelchair lifts and so much more. But just like Isaiah's vision does not actually portray an inclusive world, the passage of the ADA, nor its lawful interpretation and implementation, those things have not actually built a world of justice and full access for people with disabilities. Some people who use accessibility aids like wheelchairs and hearing devices and sight aids might relate to the language of disability. They might appreciate the way that it recognizes the struggles that they experience. Hunter talked about this a little bit. For others, the language of inclusion or disability implies something lacking about the way that they live in the world, as if the goal should be for them to live like normal people in what we would consider normative bodies, but that's just not their body. Emily Landau, a writer and disability activist and the founder of Social Justice Media Services writes, my needs are not special just because they're different from yours. My needs are not special because they're not met in ways identical to the needs of non-disabled people. I need a ramp, you need steps. Not special, just facts. I need a wheelchair, you walk. Not special, just facts. Moreover, the needs of non-disabled people certainly aren't met in all the same ways. Just like every other living, breathing human being on this planet, I am a person who has needs that must be fulfilled in ways appropriate to my abilities. Inclusion is not a question of how can we grant access to spaces where some might have previously been excluded. It's a question of how we can imagine rebuilding a world on the basis of meeting everyone's needs, whatever they are. A ramp is a necessary first step to opening the door to people who have been kept out. But we should not think that we have built an inclusive world because we have put in a ramp because we found a way to let in people who were once on the margins. Watts Belzer writes that disability rights activists emphasize many of the difficulties associated with having a disability arise because our communities aren't built for people with disabilities. Architecture, for instance, can act as a powerful form of exclusion. Stairs and tight spaces turn a wheelchair into a real liability. When communities are built with access in mind, wheels and walkers become just another way of moving through the world. Building design is a tangible, concrete example 
of how the built environment can limit the dignity and full participation of people with disabilities. But access barriers aren't just physical, she says. Social attitudes and negative perceptions of disability also exclude and marginalize people with disabilities. Making room for people with disabilities means going beyond the ramp. It calls us to transform the ways that we understand and embrace disability and difference. So yes, I'm disappointed that the Torah doesn't have a way to accommodate priests whose bodies look different from others. But I'm also disappointed with myself for thinking that what the Torah needs is accommodations and not an entirely new paradigm for service. And because May is Mental Health Awareness Month, I wanna also specifically name that not all disabilities are visible on an external body. Anything from a heart condition, emphysema, anxiety, depression, social processing disorders, autism, those can all be considered disabilities by the ADA and can make it challenging for people to feel welcomed and valued in all spaces. People with mental illnesses may need different kinds of support so that they can feel successful and welcome in community and society. And I hope that we can remember this month that inclusion also looks like helping folks who have emotional and helping folks have emotional and psychological safety in community. With internal needs, just like external ones, the language of diseases and conditions pushes us to medicalize lived experience. Just like with the language of external disability, for some people living with mental illness, this language is helpful in naming and explaining the way that they live the world. But for others, it can be flattening, a way of pathologizing their own life. So in this month of increased awareness, I wanna remind us that we need both adequate treatment for those who find their differences to be a source of suffering and greater inclusion so that we don't expect people who seem different to conform to what we call normal. Just a few weeks ago in the middle of the Torah, we read some of the most inspiring words of our tradition. Kedoshim tihiyu ki kadosh ani Adonai Eloheichem. You, all of you, are holy because I, God, am holy. It's an ethos that we see at the beginning of the Torah when we're told that everyone is made in God's image. And we see it at the end of the Torah when Moshe tells all of the gathered people that the Torah is not too far away or difficult for any of them to access. It doesn't require crossing an ocean or going far away. The Torah is there for each and every one of us to grasp. So yes, the verses in Parshat Emor let me down. Put simply, we are losing good and vital Torah when we exclude categories of people on the basis of what they look like in comparison to what other people look like. We're losing good and vital categories of Torah we, when we exclude people who think and process the world in ways that are different from the ways others think and process. When we try to fit the myriad experience of human life into one defined category, we lose out on the opportunity to learn from each other and about the world that we live in. But these verses that we read this week are not the only ones we have. And we don't inherit a tradition that requires us to make wholesale acceptance of what it says. So we see this week the ways that the text has caused hurt. And then we harness our frustration and our anger and our disappointment and we say, how can we do better? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom.